Now I want to deal with five principles of God's judgment, all of which are stated in Romans chapter 2. Romans, the second chapter, unfolds five principles of God's judgment. Now I read the Bible, first of all in Greek and the New Testament, and then I read various translations. And I, uh, I appreciate the NIV, there's a lot of good in it, but sometimes it moves away from the structure of the original. And if you listen to me and you're following the NIV, you won't get the same result as if you listen and you're following in the New King James. I'm not saying one is better than the other, I'm just saying each has its strong points, each has its weak points. There is no one perfect translation. Somebody said the NIV is the nearly inspired version. I don't know whether you've heard that. So here are the uh, five principles of God's judgment, all unfolded in Romans chapter 2. Romans 2 verse 2, we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. That's the first principle. God's judgment is based on real facts. It's not based on hearsay. I remember when uh, God wanted to find out, the Lord wanted to find out the truth about the condition of Sodom and Gomorrah. He'd heard terrible reports from the angels, from others. But you remember he said to Abraham, I've come down to see for myself. That really impresses me. God doesn't judge by hearsay. He judges according to truth. The second principle of God's judgment in verse 6 is he will render to each one according to his deeds. We will be judged for what we have done. That is a basic principle that runs right throughout the Bible. And it applies to believers as well as unbelievers. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17, 1 Peter 1, 17, Peter unfolds this principle, applying it specifically to believers. 1 Peter 1, 17. He's speaking to believers and he says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear. That's the kind of statement that isn't publicly disseminated in most churches today. But Peter says to believers, bearing in mind that you're going to be judged according to what you've done, live a reverent, godly life. Don't be rash, don't be proud, don't be presumptuous, because everything you say and do, one day you're going to have to answer to God for. And remember, that is addressed to believers, not to unbelievers. And then in Revelation 20 verse 12, it says, all the people that were judged in the final judgment were judged according to what was written in the books. So God keeps a record of every life. Now you know in the days of the New Testament, books were not like this, but they were much more like tapes. They were scrolls rolled up. And I think that's a much more clear picture. I'm inclined to think that in the judgment, this is just an opinion. Every one of us will be confronted by something like a videotape which stretches out the entire course of our life before us. I remember when God was dealing with me about four years ago when I was very sick and I was really seeking God as to why I wasn't being healed. And one night God woke me up about 2 a.m., which is the time he, he's rather in, in the habit of speaking to me, and he gave me a little review of the life I'd been leading. And I want to say I was a preacher, generally accepted, sometimes criticized, but, uh, and I was about the same level as a lot of other preachers who are comparatively well known. But God showed me that in many ways I had been extremely carnal, not committing any gross sins. I've never been involved, thank God, in sexual immorality, drunkenness, or the misappropriation of funds. Nevertheless, God showed me there were things in my past that were displeasing to him. He brought to me this scripture in Malachi. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. That's what God says. And Esau is a type 
of the carnal man. There are no gross sins recorded of Esau, but he just was a carnally minded man. And God said, I hate that. And God showed me, and I had been nearly 50 years in the ministry, there were things in my life that he hated. He showed me that I had in some respects been careless. Some of the scenes that he showed me were in restaurants. I don't know whether you realize that God judges you in restaurants too. Somebody said, all you Americans can talk about is food. Another person said, if you want to find out where the best restaurants are, ask a preacher. <laughs> now there's a certain truth in that. It's not totally true. But I'm only speaking from my own experience. I began to realize what it means to spend the time of our sojourning here in fear. Not slavish fear, but reverent awe. As, as before God who will judge everything we say and everything we do. So that's a word from First Peter. Going back to Romans chapter 2, the next principle of God's judgment is stated in verse 3. Do I mean verse 3? No, I don't. Because the thing is that it's not translated the way I want. <laughs> yes, it's Romans 2 verse 11. Now I'll explain what I mean in a way. Uh, what I mean just briefly. It says, there is no partiality with God. Now all the modern translations say that. Because it's a modern phrase. I've sometimes asked the question, can you really put the Bible in modern English without interjecting modern thinking? Because the language you use is very much an expression of the way you think. You see, the old King James said, there is no respect of persons. It's much more accurate because partiality can be to any kind of person. You may take some weak, insignificant little person and be very partial to that person. So weak, I really want to help them. I really want to do everything for them. But respect of persons means we're not impressed by what people are in their natural selves. A man may be a general, a president, a bishop, but he doesn't get any special judgment from God. He's treated just like everybody else. That's what it means when it says there is no respect of person, particularly aimed at people who occupy positions of prominence in the world today. All right, the next principle of God's judgment, number four, is according to the measure of light. And Paul says in Romans 2 verse 12, for as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. If you have the law, you'll be judged by it. If you don't have the law, you won't be judged by the law, but you'll still be judged for what you've done. And this principle is illustrated by the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, when he speaks to some of the major cities of his day who had not responded to his preaching. Matthew 11, verses 20 through 24. Then he began to upbraid the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Why? Because Tyre and Sidon had less light. Bethsaida and Chorazin had had the greatest light and they would be the most severely judged. You and I will be judged according to the light that is available to us. And I want to say, generally speaking, to people in the English-speaking world, there is a greater measure of light available to us today than I think has ever been available to any previous generation in history. We have Bibles en masse, we have endless books, we have tapes, we have cassettes, we have preachers. We're going to be judged by the light that's been made available to us. Let's bear that in mind. God's standards of judgment for this generation will be the most severe because we've had the most light. And then Jesus goes on in the next verse, you Capernaum who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. 
But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. You see, judgment is according to light. The more light we have, the more strict will be our judgment. And as I've said before, I say to each one of you, including myself, myself, there probably never has been a generation of Christians that have had the measure of light available that we have today. Bear that in mind, that's going to be the standard of our judgment. And finally, the, th the fifth principle of God's judgment, in Romans 2 verse 16, it says, In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, so God is not merely going to judge our open acts, but he's going to judge our secret innermost thoughts and motives and attitudes. And I think it's correct to say that God is very concerned about our motives. Two people may perform the same outward action, but their motives may be entirely different. And when God judges them, he will take into account their motives.